Hi, it's Dwyer. It is Sunday, May 30th, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing. Let's talk Devin Haney's win over Jorge Linares, as well as some backstories involving some people you know. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, <clears throat> we're in a golden age of boxing. Boxing right now has an image problem. To sell fights, of course, the fighters will sometimes not be on their best behavior. The people associated with the fighters might look combative, might look like they're a bit self-centered, might look like they're disconnected from the world, right? What I want people to consider is that the truth is completely the opposite. Some people you think you know, you might not. You might know a persona, but you might not know the real person. So, Floyd Mayweather, for example, right? Whatever you think you know about Floyd Mayweather, just understand, in real life, in the real world, in reality, Floyd Mayweather is a guy who quietly paid for the funeral of former excellent fighter, former champion, Hernando Hernandez, who fell on hard times, who had some health problems, who died much earlier than he should have. That funeral was quietly paid for by Floyd Mayweather. More recently, George Floyd, his funeral, was quietly paid for by Floyd Mayweather. Right? Shifting gears. Shakur Stevenson's manager, James Prince, for example. The city of Houston, one of the biggest cities in the United States, honored James Prince, Rapalot's CEO, for his philanthropy, for his charity work with children. Right now, you might think of rap a lot as, you know, a label where rappers are throwing certain images and stuff like that. Just understand in the real world, right, James Prince is spending a lot of money trying to help kids to the point where civic leaders have recognized his philanthropy. Oscar De La Hoya. has quietly funded the Cecilia Gonzalez De La Hoya Cancer Center, where De La Hoya has literally given hundreds of thousands of dollars to help develop early cancer detection systems. Right, De La Hoya is very much in the healthcare space. It's just that no one's gonna talk about that in public. Right? When you see him these days, he's on Triller talking about upcoming fights. Right? Just to understand there's more to the guy. There's also this perception that there's some nefarious people operating in the shadows who are out there, uh, you know, cutting side deals with fighters and, um, you know, they aren't. You know, they're relying on personal relationships more than expertise and stuff like that. You know, the truth is far different. Would it shock you to know that Bob Arum went to Harvard Law School? Would it surprise you to know that he's not the only Harvard grad with a lot of power in boxing? That Al Heyman is a Harvard grad. Right? If you're a New Yorker, you know that New York has some elite high schools. Two-time manager of the year, Shelley Finkel, who, of course, co-manages Deontay Wilder with Al Heyman. Right? Went to Brooklyn Tech. 
Shelly Finkel, by the way, has been a member of the Boxing Hall of Fame for years. Right? He's already a Hall of Famer, folks. This is really Shelly Finkel's post-Hall of Fame career. And, of course, Shelly Finkel and Al Heyman were able to get their fighter, Deontay Wilder, his third fight against Tyson Fury. That's what good managers are supposed to do. Let me also point out, too, that in a sport where sometimes managers get 33% of their fighter's purse, just understand that Al Heyman only takes 10%, right? Let me also say, too, I know many of you are, have been a little bit critical of Al Heyman. The feeling is that <clears throat> PBC is a little bit too in-house. What I want people to do is to recognize that PBC of late has actually been pushing for unification matches. Let me tip my hat here to Jermel Charlo, who's about to fight for the undisputed championship at 154 against Brian Castano. Very tough fight. Castano, of course, is unbeaten. Let me also point out, too, that the Wilder Fury fight, right? Understand, that's a fight where, of course, Wilder's trying to get Fury's titles, right? The title that Wilder had, that he lost in the rematch, and of course Fury's lineal championship, which some of us, at least I, take quite seriously. And of course, understand too, the Errol Spence, Manny Pacquiao fight can be viewed as a unification match. Now all of that background is to point out that no one in boxing in the entire sport has the opportunity right now that Teofimo Lopez has. Teofimo has a number of belts at 135 pounds. Let's just think this through. He's missing one. That's the belt held by Devin Haney. But understand, you've had a recent development that gives Lopez something others just don't have. He has two paths, not one, but two paths. One of them doesn't even involve Devin Haney. To undisputed dominance of a boxing weight class, right? At 135, one path is to go to Devin, go through Devin Haney. But understand, Josh Taylor has just won the belt. In fact, he's just won the undisputed dominance, the belts, at 140 pounds. So Lopez is in an interesting position where if he beats George Cambrosis, Lopez can either fight Devin Haney to be undisputed at 135, assuming he can reach a deal with the different sanctioning bodies and their different mandatory challengers. So he's allowed to fight Haney for the undisputed titles at 135. Or he can pivot and he can fight Josh Taylor, assuming Josh Taylor gets by his next mandatory for the undisputed bouts at 140 pounds. Folks, this is rare in boxing. Some great fighters never get the opportunity to fight for undisputed status. That's what we'll call it. It feels silly saying undisputed titles, right? Here you have a fighter who's unbeaten, who's already beaten Lomachenko. Right here you have an unbeaten fighter who's already taken out one of the guys widely regarded as one of the best in the sport pound for pound. 
and he has an opportunity, quite frankly, to be undisputed in not one but two different weight class. Right? For the record, and we'll get back to it, I think Josh Taylor beats him. For the record, right now, while I view Devin Haney as having a higher ceiling than Teofimo Lopez, I feel Teofimo, based on what I saw yesterday in Haney's fight against Linares, I believe Lopez beats Devin Haney. Let's talk about it. The Haney-Linares fight is very important. Right? It's very important because I believe the way to beat Teofimo Lopez, and I'm talking about an unbeaten fighter, and it's important here that I make a distinction. I'm just talking about my views. You need to have your own views. I'm theorizing here. I'm reaching conclusions here just based on what I've seen. They may be true, they may not be true. This is just the voice of one gambler. But in my opinion, there are two Teofimo Lopez's. There's the sharp sniper, who's a master counterpuncher, who hits harder than Lo Jorge Linares, who's actually a big time puncher, who has some of the best timing in boxing, who can get on his front foot and who can deconstruct Lomachenko. Right? Excellent left hook. Better defense than you think. Pinpoint accuracy. Twitchy. Hand speed. Sudden. Now there's that Teofimo Lopez. Right? Don't get fooled by the persona. On his front foot, he's a technician. This is a guy who clearly is a student of the game and has been since day one. But understand, the front foot's only half the game, isn't it? There's something called a back foot. Sometimes when a front foot heavy fighter is forced onto his back foot, you notice it throws everything off. Right? I believe had Lomachenko, who we're hearing now was injured going into the fight, had a shoulder problem. Had Lomachenko fought let's say, the middle of the fight, the way he fights the last third of the fight. I believe he could have beaten Lopez. I think if a guy can stay in the pocket with Lopez, not allow Lopez to step forward, but force him onto his back foot, if a guy can figure out too, because Lopez is precise, Right? Lopez has figured out, okay, he's hitting me here. So Lopez, a counterpuncher, will have a hand up right where you're hitting him to catch your shot so he can counter you. Right? A Nakatani in Lopez's toughest fight to date. I believe that fight was tougher for Lopez than the Lomachenko fight. A Nakatani might hit you here once, but the next time might be up here. And that was throwing Lopez off. There's a loop on the punch. It's like a curveball in baseball. The guy who can throw different curveballs is the one who could hurt Lopez, especially if they get Lopez on his back foot. Comey was in the process of trying to get Lopez on his back foot when Lopez hits him with clean hooks that end that fight. Getting Lopez on his back foot is harder than it seems. Well, yesterday, you saw Devin Haney against 
multi-champion Jorge Linares preparing for the Lopez fight by staying in the pocket. Folks, the beginning of the fight, Haney's masterful. Right? Haney is in the pocket and he's rolling. Right? They have him set up in such a way where he doesn't have his hands up. Where it would cut down on his speed. No, Devin Haney is in a shell. And his defense against Linares is to roll with punches. Haney also, and this was new for Devin Haney as I see it, is in the pocket throwing a withering body attack. Haney also, Haney's a better athlete than most in the sport. Haney also was able to stay low at times. This, by the way, is what got Billy Joe Saunders in trouble against Canelo. Haney was able to stay low for a time and come up with uppercuts. Haney looked good. You could tell that he'd been training with Floyd Mayweather. Right? Some of what he was doing, keeping his hands free so he could throw punches, moving, Right, having the other guy's punch either miss him as he rolled away from it or hit a shoulder. Right, which would allow Haney to throw left hooks because he's not tying up that left hand blocking the punch. Right, Haney looked downright scary, downright masterful at times in the first three rounds. But then the fight got hairy. This fight, I understand the scorecard showed Haney winning by several rounds. But understand, this is boxing. I don't have to win on the scorecards to beat you. I can knock you down. I can win by KO. Also, you can be win more rounds than me. If I get 10-8 rounds... If I get 10, seven rounds, I can make things up in a hurry. Especially if I punch like Teofimo Lopez. Well here, I want people to revisit the film of this fight. You'll notice in rounds four, five, six, seven, eight, you'll notice that Linares, who I believe had to be surprised that Haney was tethered to the pocket. Haney has some of the best legs in boxing. Haney decides to go flat-footed this fight. This fight had some shades of Roberto Duran, Ray Leonard, the first fight, where Ray, for some reason, decides he's going to stay in the pocket with Duran. By the way, that got Ray his first loss. Well, here, Haney decides he's going to stay in the pocket with Linares. Now understand, boxing has, we'll call them, KG vets. I'm telling you from the fourth round to the end of the fight, Linares understands that there's a hole in Haney's game. It's on the film, folks. One man's opinion. Right? Haney comes in, he's very fast, right? Haney's in the pocket, Haney lands punches. But as Haney backs away, I thought he was open for Linares' counter left hook. Now Linares comes close many times to landing that counter left hook. Understand how the fight would have changed. He does land it a few times. Right? And it stuns Haney, who has a poker face. Right? You get the feeling that if you shot Haney, Haney's facial expression wouldn't change that much. The point, though, is Linares just doesn't have the left hook that a Mayweather or a Canelo or a Lopez has. 
Or let's give him props, future Hall of Famer, great night last night, an Anito Denier has. Right? Look at Denier stopping Vic Jarchinian, for example. So understand, there's a group in boxing right now that saw yesterday's fight. We'll call them the counterpunchers. And they're thinking to themselves, you know what? Haney's a better athlete than me. Haney's faster than me. But now that Haney has decided that he's going to try to fight some fights deep in the pocket, I'm going to have counterpunching opportunities. I just have to survive Haney's initial blows. Because as he backs away, he'll be open for the left hook. So let me tell you what happens in this fight. One man's opinion. Haney wins the fight by several rounds on the scorecards. Haney has moments where he comes close to losing the fight entirely. Because he's hit with left hooks. We don't know because of Haney's body language, because of his poker face, which I'm sure he's rehearsed, how badly hurt he was. But here's what we do know. At the end of the 10th round, Lenares throws, instead of the left hook that he's been measuring, measuring Haney for, Lenares, after a while, starts trying to throw counter right hands. Right? This is Lenares' entire game. This is the, what KG vets do. Right? Haney's here throwing punches. Lenares is just trying to parry the punches enough so he's in position to throw the punch. So he starts measuring Haney for a counter right hand. Right? Sergio Mora, the Latin snake on the telecast, starts urging Lenares to throw the counter right hand. As I said, counter punchers looked at this fight and started to get excited. They saw the opportunity. So at the end of the 10th round, I believe it's the 10th round, Lenares in the closing seconds of the round, life would have been different. Had Lenares done this in the first minute of the round, but in the closing seconds of the round, after a Haney onslaught, Lenares throws a short counter right hand. Right now, let's just say it's the counter left hook that looks like it's there for Lenares in the earlier rounds. Lenares' right hand, it's a straight right hand that he throws here. Right? Haney's badly hurt. I understand in the post-fight interview, Haney said, hey, I wasn't hurt and stuff like that. Look, let's be blunt here. You know, as I see it, it doesn't even matter whether Haney was hurt or not. It's whether Haney's body is ready to continue to fight. Haney is hit so hard in the closing seconds of the round that Haney's legs betray him as he walks to the corner. You see him stagger, right? Forget the poker face. Forget the, hey, he never hit me hard. I didn't feel his punches, right? Which is what Julio Cesar Chavez famously said after losing to Oscar De La Hoya, right? I didn't feel his punches. Look, forget all that talk. Haney's body felt the punches. Haney's legs were uncoordinated. Let me just point out that the 11th round, you knew Haney wasn't 100%. Folks, Haney wasn't 80%. First off, it was later in the fight, so the guys are a little tired. But you knew Haney was greatly diminished from where he was before getting hit with that counter right hand. So Haney is holding on to Lenares. Haney, for the rest of the fight, is outside. Then he would get low and run in to grab Lenares. Now let me just say this, and I, I don't say it lightly. 
Linares seemed to be surprised at certain times of the fight. When some guy who's not accustomed to being in the pocket decides he's going to fight you in the pocket, which is what Haney did. I'm surprised that Linares, who is a vet, I believe it was just the shock of Haney deciding he's going to be in the pocket. Kind of like the shock, in my opinion, Golovkin must have felt. Seeing Canelo trying to crash the pocket against him in the rematch. What I believe, in hindsight, Linares should have done is in the 11th round when Haney is trying to run into the pocket to hold him. Linares should have taken a step back. Linares should have been on his back foot. The idea should have been you're running into the pocket. Okay, here's the pocket. What are you going to do with it? Let me go one step further. Linares should have just had a hand out. I know this isn't a completely legal move. But Linares could have covered it as if he's measuring Haney, just so Haney would have no opportunity to run all the way inside to hold him. Right? What I want people to do is to look at some old Mike McCallum films, where McCallum would have a guy hurt, then the guy would try to grab him. Look at Golovkin films, where Golovkin has a guy hurt, the guy's trying to hold him, and Golovkin is there trying to knock away the guy's hand, right? When you know a guy is hurt, whether he admits it to boxing fans or not, whether he thinks he's lucid, but he knows he's having problems with his legs, which is where I believe Devin Haney was in the 11th round, then you can't allow him to hold. Devin Haney was awfully close in my opinion, of being knocked down in the last two rounds of this fight. Jorge Linares knows he had multiple opportunities here to badly hurt Devin Haney. Right? He catches him with some counter left hooks. Player double, triple up on the left hook. Let me also say this too. You're fighting a guy and he's crashing the pocket in the third round and stuff like that. If that's his game plan and you know he's usually a guy who's outside circling you, working behind a jab. Here he's in the pocket trying to hit your body and stuff like that. Why didn't Linares take a step back, move laterally, get out of the pocket, have Haney who was trying to be front foot here. Live with the consequences of that decision. Would have changed up the angles. Haney might have found himself trying to stalk Linares, right, and may have had his defense fall apart on him. So look, don't get me wrong. My pre-fight prediction was Haney would win the fight. Haney delivered, right? In hindsight, the odds might have not made this fight bettable. Don't get me wrong. You got a profit, so we can just talk about it. But the odds were too stretched here. Let's just say, though, that Haney right now, because being in the pocket the way he was against Linares is new for him. Because it looked like he could get hit as he rose up while in the pocket after throwing shots. Right? He looked open for counters. While I do believe in Devin Haney's ceiling, I just don't think against a sharpshooter like Teofimo Lopez that Haney is there yet. I don't think Haney, put simply, is at the point where he can defensively handle Lopez's counters. Right? I think Lopez is too good deep in the pocket. He's too precise. And he hits harder than Linares. For Haney to make the adjustments 
where he'll be able to protect himself from Lopez counter hooks. Let me also say too that when you have a multiplicity of skills, use them, right? Haney showed you yesterday he can go flat footed, great. But when you're fighting a vet like Jorge Linares, mix it up, right? Haney starts the fight, great, wins the first three rounds. Well, my point is simply, okay, look, you have a lead now. You've proven you could fight in the pocket against Linares. Don't keep the angles the same. When you have a back foot game you can start using, don't stay in the pocket so that Linares then figures out that you're vulnerable to counter hooks. Let me say this too. You know, Linares got KO'd early in multiple fights. I believe Haney was trying to make a statement here. So he's stalking Linares early. Right? He's in the pocket. He's throwing hard punches. He's throwing body punches. He's throwing uppercuts. When Linares is still standing after four or five rounds, right? Player, get on your back foot. You know, mix it up. Bring some element of surprise. Don't stay in the pocket. So forgive me. But I thought this fight was much closer than most. The guys on the zone were a bit surprised by the scoring. Right? Linares lost the fight by at least four rounds. Right? But I believe the judges saw the problems Haney was having with Linares' counter left hand. I believe the judges saw the problems Haney was having after getting hit with that counter right hand at the end of the 10th round. Understand, Haney was so bad off that a guy with great legs couldn't even decide to stay outside in the 11th and 12th rounds because I believe Haney understood that his legs might betray him. So he comes in and he's grabbing Linares instead of just playing it like Josh Taylor played the 12th round against Ramirez. Being outside, using your legs, staying away, not throwing a lot, but not getting hit with a lot. Right? Forcing the other guy to try to find you. Here you had Haney in clinch mode. So I congratulate Devin Haney on the win. Let's just say I believe there are a bunch of counterpunchers looking at Devin Haney and thinking to themselves, I might be able to hit this guy with a check left hook. Josh Taylor, the first knockdown of the Ramirez fight, is a check left hook, isn't it? Ramirez is crashing the pocket. Josh Taylor looks too available, doesn't he? Josh Taylor is over by the ropes, just like Floyd Mayweather was against Ricky Hatton, right? It's as if Josh Taylor was saying, hey, here I am. Play, you don't even have to find me. Hey, look at this. I'm pinned in against the ropes. Come get at me. Then, of course, Ramirez jumps in, throws a punch. Josh Taylor's ready. Josh Taylor leans back. Punch misses him. Josh Taylor throws a short left hand. Ramirez is on the canvas. Let me just say this. I know the Ramirez people are saying, hey, man, we didn't like the knockdown that arguably was on the break. Well, let's remember, that was the second time Ramirez hit the canvas. There's a clean check left hook knockdown in that fight. If I'm Josh Taylor and I'm looking at the film of yesterday's Haney Linares fight, I'm thinking, well, why can't I throw that check left hook? against Devin Haney. Right? All I got to do is to prepare for Haney's initial onslaught. Do enough to survive that. Right? Dodge a punch. You know, Haney comes in, assume, okay, he might throw a punch up top, just like Ramirez. 
Let me just be prepared to jump back. Then I'm going to have a countering opportunity. You remember Ricky Hatton runs in on Floyd Mayweather, right? Floyd, like Josh Taylor, is like, hey, here I am, player, right by the ropes. Right, folks, I'm, I'm here for the taking. Ricky Hatton runs in, gets hit with a check left hook. Ends Ricky Hatton's unbeaten streak. Well, here, Linares had clean opportunities to do that to Devin Haney's unbeaten streak. Let's just say he came closer than you think. If you rewatch this film starting at in the fourth round, I want you to just key on Linares' counter left hook. Just, just key on it. You're going to notice Linares is throwing it several times around. You're going to notice a few times he hits Haney with it, but Haney happens to be rolling away from it. Understand the punch is there. Then you'll notice toward the end of the fight when Linares realizes, look, I need a stoppage to win this fight. I'm too far behind on the scorecards. Linares then starts keying on a counter right hand. And when he lands it, there simply is just not enough time left in the round to capitalize on it. Right? If the same punch landed with a minute left in that 10th round, Haney could have been stopped. So let's pay close attention to 135. Lopez has a huge decision to make. Does he want to fight Haney, unify at 135, then move up to 140 where he doesn't have to worry about skipping dessert again and then focus on 140? Or does he want to strike while the coals are hot? Right? Josh Taylor just beat Ramirez. The eyes of the boxing world are on Josh Taylor. Josh Taylor has a mandatory coming up. Okay, we all respect that. Right? But after that mandatory, if you're Teofimo, you're unbeaten, you might say to yourself, you know what, I can get this undisputed title at 140 and then fight Devin Haney down the road, right? Because it looks like Devin Haney is going to be dominant for a while unless he's in against a real skill counterpuncher, right? Let me just say this too. Styles do make fights. As I was looking at the Devin Haney clip, and obviously Haney would fight Canelo differently, just style-wise. But I was looking at Devin Haney and I thought, that's exactly the fight style. That would get Canelo a KO. Right? Haney, Haney's in the pocket, just like Billy Joe Saunders is. He's bending over low in the pocket. Now, Linares isn't really an uppercut guy, right? Other than counterpunchers, the uppercut group must be salivating, looking at this Haney-Linares film, right? Haney's in the pocket. Haney looks open for counters, right? I'm, I'm just imagining a big puncher like Canelo who can throw that uppercut, as he did in ending the Saunders fight but who also has that explosive left hook that has ring coverage. In other words, as a Devin Haney's backing away, Canelo can throw that left hook and it'll travel. Right? Look at the end of the Kovalev fight. Right? Kovalev gets hit first with the left hook. Then Canelo comes across with the right hand. Right? Styles make fights. I'm sure Canelo today is thinking, man, it's too bad. Unbeaten Devin Haney isn't a super middleweight. <laughs> I'm sure Canelo's people would sign that fight in two seconds. So to Devin Haney, hey, it was great seeing your front foot yesterday. Mix it up with your back foot, please. Understand, like Ray Leonard did in the Duran rematch, that there are going to be some nights where you want to accent the back foot, right? Also, 
to all boxers. When the fight fans see your legs jingling and stuff like that, you're fooling nobody, claiming that you weren't hurt in the fight. When fight fans see you trying to clinch a guy, right? You have great legs, but guess what? 11th rounds here, 12th rounds here, you've just been hit with a great right counter. Oh, you're trying to clinch the guy. You're fooling nobody, claiming you were never hurt in that fight. So I congratulate Devin Haney. I'm not sure if he's ready for Lopez right now. I assume Lopez beats Cambrosis. If I'm Lopez, I have to ask myself, am I ready for 140 right now? If the phone rings and it's Josh Taylor, I might have to answer that call. Knowing that 140 is loaded, think about it. If Lopez were to beat Josh Taylor, and it's a great fight, then you get the rematch. Another great payday. Then there are guys at 140. Right? Regis Progre. Ramirez. Zapata. Right? You got guys at 140 that would give Lopez several big paydays. Might turn 140 into what 147 is right now with Spence, Pacquiao, Crawford. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by and happy holiday weekend.